few fine points would be worth considering at this stage. Let's go back to our classification confusion or error matrices that we got for the training partition on various values of k. We have shown the results for k equals 1, 3, and 5, hypothetical results, because we didn't have 50 rows in our training B partition. OK, so now looking at the error matrix for k equals 1, we saw that it got 40 out of the 50 correct. 30 plus 10, 40, and the total is 50 for an 80% correctness performance. The second case, we had 43 out of 50. That's an 86% correctness. And finally, we had 33 on 50, which is a 66% correctness. Right? So we went by this and said, oh, k equals 3 gives us the highest performance of 86%. Let's go with k equals 3. OK. Now here, there's actually an assumption. right? There's an assumption in the sense of we are saying that any error is the same. That is, the error of classifying an owner as a non-owner is exactly the same as the error of classifying a non-owner as an owner. Okay. In other words, we are just considering the overall error rate or overall performance rate and going with that. But are all errors created equal? In other words, the cost of classifying an owner as a non-owner may be different from the cost of classifying a non-owner as an owner. Take a concrete example. Right? Suppose you classify somebody as an owner and send them a brochure. Okay? So the brochure may cost you 50 cents or a dollar. You sent them the brochure. So if you classify a non-owner as an owner, right? you send the brochure to them, you incur the cost of sending the brochure, they're not going to buy your product. right? So your cost then is, let's say, a dollar or two dollars, or whatever the cost of mailing the brochure is. right? Now, if you classify a non-owner as an owner, you send the brochure by mistake and he does, the person doesn't buy and you incur the cost of the brochure. Now, what if you classify a non-owner, an owner, as a non-owner? In other words, somebody who is likely to buy the product, but your algorithm or your data analytics method says, no, they won't buy the product. right? So it mistakenly classifies an owner as a non-owner. In that case, what is your cost? You don't send them the brochure, and they don't buy your product. In that case, what's your cost? You saved on sending the brochure, a couple of bucks, but if they bought your product, maybe you would have made a profit of $25, right? So the cost of classifying an owner as a non-owner is much higher than the cost of classifying a non-owner as an owner. It could be much higher, right? In that case, the costs are not symmetric. You have a situation of asymmetric costs, Right? So you would much rather make the mistake of classifying a non-owner as an owner as opposed to classifying an owner as a non-owner. Right? So when you select the correct value of k, you may not always go by absolute performance. For instance, let's say that with the model, you can get a performance of 86% correct. Now we are going with just the overall correctness. Is this good or bad? We cannot go by just the absolute performance. The value of a model comes from the improvement that the model provides. Let's say just hypothetically, without a model, you could have got 95% correct. With the model, you're getting 86% correct. The model is obviously inferior. On the other hand, without the model, suppose you could, you could get only 50% correct. With the model, you're getting 86% correct. That's an improvement, right? So we have to look at the performance of the model in conjunction with what you will do without the model. Okay. Now, how do you know how, what performance you can achieve without the model? In other words, if you had no access to the model, how would you predict if somebody would be a buyer or a non-buyer? One approach would be to say, well, in my entire population, I have 26% of the 20% of the people happen to be buyers. 
Okay. Now, if you have absolutely no model whatsoever, you know that 80% of the people are non-buyers and the best you can do for anybody is to say they're going to be a non-buyer because that's far more likely than them being a buyer. So you will then have to predict everybody as a non-buyer. Okay. So now that means you will get 80% of the time you'll be correct, 20% of the time you'll be wrong. Right. In fact, you'll be wrong for every buyer because you will predict everybody as a non-buyer. Okay. Whereas with the model, you're able to get, let's say, 86% correct. So you're now saying it's 80% versus 86%. I'm getting a lift of 86 divided by 80. On the other hand, you may look at the performance only on buyers. Okay. Completely ignore the non-buyers. So you may say without the model, I might be able to get, you know, predict 10% of the buyers correctly or 50% of the buyers correctly. With the model, I am able to predict 75% of the buyers correctly. So then you can say the performance of the model or the lift of the model is 75 divided by 50, which is 1.5. Okay. So you look at the performance based on the baseline, the baseline performance as opposed to the model performance. You cannot just go with absolute values, right? Now, sometimes even a 10% improvement may be a huge improvement. Sometimes even a 50% improvement may not be worth it. It completely depends on the context, right? If by correctly predicting a buyer as a buyer, if you stand to gain a whole lot, then even a slight improvement is huge. That's the point, okay? So we talk in terms of lift of the model, which is performance without the model, with the model, divided by performance without the model. That's the amount of lift that the model is giving you.